Welcome everyone to the first post-harvest debrief webinar. Um, I think this was an idea of yours, Nigel, wasn't it? Um, it was, yep. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it would just be a good idea for everyone to have a get together, but um, yeah, we can't quite get together. So this is sort of the second best option, I suppose. So the intention was we were gonna have a big day um, somewhere in South Canterbury probably and um, get five or six of the quorum sense farmers, arable farmers that have been um, trialing quite a lot of things in this last season in particular um, to come together, a bit of a presentation, a bit of a chin wag um, and yeah, sort of debrief on what worked and what hadn't and how the season was going and make it a bit of an annual annual event. Yep. Um, and this is our virtual compromise. Um, so we're looking at running a series of maybe five or six of these for the next uh, five or six weeks. So every Thursday night, 8 p.m., we're going to be running one. Um, David Burkett's up next week. Um, and the others are t to be confirmed. Um, for those of you that haven't um, been on a Zoom webinar before, um, effectively the, um, well, for this one, uh, we actually pre-recorded um, a presentation from Nigel. Um, and then myself, Dave Burkett, and Simon Osborne were on as well, just um, pitching a few questions that we thought everyone would be interested in. Um, so we're gonna run that for about 40 minutes, uh, and then we'll open it up for the Q&A. And so you'll see down at the bottom of your screens, there's a um, the, the highlight ribbon that comes up there that says Q&A. Um, so you can just type questions in there, and if, there's, if you see questions that you really like, you can vote them up to the top. Um, so we can prioritize those. Um, I don't think you can vote for yourself. And um, <laughs> for spoil sport. Yeah. Yep. And um, also uh, there's that chat function, which Simon White's already found. Um, so if there's any issues, if you can't hear me or um, if there's any anything that's not a question, feel free to chuck that in there and um, that's sitting up on my screen as well. And um, yeah, otherwise we're sort of thought this would run for about um, an hour and a quarter, so about 40 minutes um, of the pres recorded presentation and then about half an hour for um, Q&A and we'll, we'll just play that by ear. Um, but we'll kick off with some written questions. So if the stuff that comes up to you as we're cruising through, feel free to chuck them in straight away into that Q&A box. And uh, yeah, and um, anything I missed, Nigel? Um. So the questions will be asked written, but I'll, well, they'll be answered verbally, I suppose. Is that how it works? Yeah, what I'll, um, yeah, so basically I'll look at the written questions and as they're coming out and I'll just ask you. Um, oh, good as so gold. So that everyone knows, I'll read it out so that everyone knows what you're answering. Cool. Um, so yeah, keep it simple so you don't have to pay too much attention to that. Sounds good. Um, yeah, so, um, and yeah, so we didn't actually, no, no, we did. Right, so um, just I will get this video going, um, sit back and relax and enjoy. Um, it's a pretty cool conversation um, and look forward to uh, the questions that, that come off the back of it. Um, and yeah, so I will share my screen. Usually this works. Uh, right, -o. so yeah, so this I've... Um, for the last six years I've been farming, I, for the last six years I've been farming, uh, mainly just cropping farming. Uh, previous to that I was doing fresh market carrots. Uh, so the whole time, for the last six years I've been aiming at going no-till and as of uh, two years ago I was able to purchase a no-till drill, which is one of Simon Osborne's earlier models, uh, which I'm busy, busy whipping into shape into, yeah, bring it up to 2015 model, uh, 2020 model, sorry, from a 20, uh, 2011 model. Um, so it's been uh, originally come up from uh, Kuria, from Kuria. So it's had a few boulders thrown through it. There's a bit, a few bends here and there, but yeah, we're getting there slowly. Um, so yeah, so gone no till. Um, and in the last couple of years, or well, the last 12 months, really, I've been um, uh, full cover cropping. Um, Previous to that, I was hardly understood cover cropping, really, to tell you the truth. Um, and I was reasonably conventional, but aiming at going, at aiming at no-till. 
But I think the um, the cover cropping certainly adds a new dimension to yeah to what we're up to. Um, so I've played with uh, planting green, uh, planting desiccated, and I've found yeah not really a lot of difference. Um, some some crops I've planted into full green cover. Some I've had them desiccated for a few weeks, and yeah no differences between the two um in light recently i've come to the you know come to realize that perhaps there is maybe in a dry season the chance of um, glyphosate residue coming out the root exudates which could potentially um, hold back the new sown crop which is sort of in the back of my mind but um haven't had any issues with that as yet um so one of my one of my main crop, one of my favourite crops to grow has been my spray-free wheat, um, which, yeah, I can't get my slide to work, which has been, um, yeah, been successful, reasonably successful. Um, uh, first two years I grew, I managed to get uh, around the eight tonne yield with high quality, yeah, high, high milling quality. Uh, next year was a um, was a six ton crop and this year it was only a four ton crop which was I was quite disappointed about. Um, the differences between the, the four seasons were um, this year I planted into a green cover crop and I think I think from what what happened was the cover crop was the digestion of the cover crop was probably starving the crop for nitrogen for the first few weeks, which told, yeah, which was the telling factor. I uh, probably needed to be a lot more aggressive with that first end application. Um, so yeah, the plants struggled to tiller, and then with poor part, uh, no, with yeah, with limited tillering, I had a lot of open space, which led in the weeds, which was just a compounding factor. Uh, so quite disappointed with the four ton. Um, the, I guess the saving grace was it. Um, it only cost me just just shy of two and a half ton to grow. So I didn't lose anything on it, but I didn't really make anything either. So going forward for that, I think um, yeah, the the nitrogen early nitrogen application I have to be a lot earlier with, probably even pre plant maybe. Um, whether I go in with 100, 100 kilos of sulfate of ammonia or something like that, a couple of weeks pre-plant. Um, that's sort of going forward, it'll be something I'm playing with again. Um, but yeah, so once, but previous years, yeah, crop's gone well. Um, foliar brew, so I've used, yeah, I'm using um, fish kelp mobiliser. Um, we have a bit of an issue around here with manganese deficiency which seems to rear its head. So these, this foliar brew goes on oh, about four, four times. Uh, the kelp is only t twice in the, in the mix, but um, that's my general brew. Um, I do up the UAN a wee bit at times if needed. Um, and I am applying, applying solid, solid urea as well. Um, and I use the peppermint oil as there as a Safeguard if I need it. Um, I've got yellow sticky traps in the paddock, two or three sites. Um, if I see any bugs that I, aphids mainly is the one I'm looking for. And if I see any aphids about, um, I'll use, yes, yeah, seven, if it's a very light infestation, um, I'll use, yes, yeah, sort of 75 mils to the hectare. Um, if, there's a, if there's a big surge, I'll come in with 100 mils to the hectare. And the peppermint oil, while I don't think kills, I'm pretty sure it doesn't kill aphids, it certainly, certainly don't like it. And they bugger off pretty quick. So I buy it from Suncoast Plantations in um, Australia. And the lady over there, she's pretty easy to deal with. I actually met her at the Umundi Markets four or five years ago. We are over there on a family holiday. So, so she's easy to deal with. And so you yeah, feel free to, to contact her if you have any issues. Um, Peppermint oil is easy to, easy to obtain. And um, yeah, I think it works out at about $15 a hectare for a full 100 mils to the hectare. Um, so this is this year's spray-free wheat. 
um, companion planted with Phacelia, which was also another one of my little trials that didn't really work this year. Um, the Phacelia at harvest time, while it had dropped its seeds, the, the um, I think the growing season was pretty good and for the Phacelia and it, uh, the stalks were quite bold and the combine chipped them into the perfect size so they were I couldn't separate them with the combine, so I've ended up having to um, scalp the scalp the wheat to get rid of the the um, the phacelia stalks. So going forward, I think um, companion companions cropping with my cereals with phacelia is a no go for spring. Uh, it has worked well with the um, with the autumn sow and stuff because um, the the plants have you know dropped their seeds earlier and the yeah, the, the stalks are dispersed really. But um, yeah, spring sowing the the, the, um, the phacelia plant was too vigorous. It did, well it didn't, I don't think it contributed to any yield loss. Um, I do think it, yeah, it did, has cost, cost time and effort with scalping. And, um, but yeah, the, I know the, the, the beekeepers were pretty, pretty happy because it was a very low season coming in. The clovers were really late and seems like the bees were the only thing they had in the area were gorse and um and my phacelia companions so it did have its advantages but i think when i'm actually focusing on trying to get a crop off the paddock um yeah spring wise it hasn't really hasn't helped me this year but hey you live and learn um but you can see that the bees certainly love it uh, i had autumn zone barleys that had uh phacelia in it and they were they, yeah, that worked really well. There was no sign of the phacelia through in the harvest sample. Um, and yeah, again, keep, I think that also, while, it, while it's really good for the bees, it also helps keep the beneficials in the paddock. And um, yeah, the, I, haven't, I haven't actually needed the peppermint oil this season at all for myself, apart from on my sunflowers, which I'll go into later on. Um, so yes, yeah, spray free wheat, was, I chopped the residue. And then afterwards, you end up with a nice crop of phacelia coming through in the stubble. Um, land grazing three or four weeks later, post harvest. So it's it's got its benefits in that way. But um, yeah, when you're actually aiming at the at the at the cereal crop, it's um, yeah, it can be a bit annoying. Hey Nigel, yes. Uh, is there any uh, companions that you have had success with in spring? Um, so this my second year companion cropping. Last year actually went okay. Um, I think the growing season was a very was very different, and the phacelia never got the bulk. Um, so it worked last year well. Um, this year it didn't work well. So I think yeah, but I I, I think some low growing clovers or even the likes of bursine clover or crimson clover might be all right under the knee, underneath. Um, even even just back to huia, just back to white clover could be okay, but you've got to make sure. I think yeah, I've got to I've got to make sure I get that plant, those plants tillering early to try and get a bit of smother. Otherwise, the companion could end up being uh, too vigorous, and which you end up running into trouble as well. So it's just playing with those. I think legumes would probably be a good one to try underneath, but I just yeah, that's that's next year's next year's trials. So Nigel, with your cover crops, in each of those years when you had different yields from your wheat, were they the same cover crops? And do you think those different cover crops have had an effect? The type of type of cover crops you've planted have uh, had possibly, an effect on the possibly. Um, so the, the first the first two years, um, the cover crop was mainly uh, was regrowth white clover, so it was was not a diverse cover crop. Um, that was before I'd really clicked into the cover crop ideas. Um, the next, the following year was red clover white, the six ton year was red clover, white clover, oats and phacelia. And it was, it was good. Um, I got good, good ground cover, good smother of the weeds with the wheat coming up and it worked pretty well. And then I planted phacelia also with, as a companion. And then this last season was, um, it was oats, tears, phacelia, linseed. Um, and it was planted into white clover. 
it's quite a strong um, broadleaf white clover. So I had a pretty reasonable cover crop, but I just, I think because I was planting green, so I only plant, I only um, desiccated the cover crop two or three days pre, pre sow this time. And I just, because of the, the bulk of that cover crop, I think that's where my nitrogen died, nitrogen was tied up, even though I had applied I was 100 kilos of sulfate of ammonia with some micronutrients about four or five weeks pre pre so I just I still think I still think it was that nitrogen tie up with the very bulky cover crop. Um, so that's just yeah food for thought going forward really. Is there a, um, a grazing option there in future pre plant? Uh, there could be. I'd have to I'd have to hire some grazing in. Um, we only have 200 ewes. So, yeah, it takes a while to get across, across a bulky, you know, sort of, I suppose it'd be a 4,000, three and a half, 4,000 um, kilograms of dry matter cover crop. So it'd take a while to get across. I could get my neighbour and he's got a few, uh, oh, nearly a thousand sheep. So it is a possibility, but I do think, I do think the, um, the cover, leaving the cover crop to do what it was doing is still a good idea. Uh, for weed cover, especially with the spray-free crops, is where the grazing, you know, you're, you are actually walking nutrients and de um, cover density out, out the gate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, going forward, I think, I do think that, yeah, maybe, maybe getting rid of the cover crop, desiccating the cover crop earlier is probably an advantage. Maybe having a you know, good, good two, maybe three weeks pre-plant, and applying, even if it is with the drill, applying a, a bit more nitrogen at planting, just to make sure I'm not not starving the crop. Yeah, I'm 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 learning on this one, so yeah, I've got yeah, I'll be ask, asking advice on that one really. It's um, yeah, all these things to try. They're only a failure, I suppose, if you do them two years in a row, aren't they? <laughs> um, so the next slide up, this is my um, spray-free oats from the previous previous year. Um, they they went well. Um, grew the same thing again this year. Was aiming at spray-free oats again this season, but um, I learnt I learnt quite a valuable lesson. So I um, these two two leaf analysis. One went away mid July. One and it was the, the oats were pretty well humming. They were um, sown into full full barley residue, full retained barley residue. Um, they never really looked like they were lacking a lot, but I did put um, they did get a foliar, if two two or three foliars going through the winter. Um, manganese, boron, and magnesium were sort of the main ones I was was aiming at. Um, just to try and perk them up, and the crop looked really stunning. It was it was ungrazed. It was ticking its way through. It survived the winter really well. And then I thought, oh, it's springtime. It's time to have another another snapshot on what's going on. And so I sent this next test away to Hills, and it came back as a real head scratcher. And I couldn't couldn't quite fathom it. And I actually rang them, and I I said, you know, has has something gone wrong? And the guy I talked to on the phone, he was like, oh, perhaps they've Put the decimal point in the wrong place when they were um, doing the calculations, but they reran the test and it came back identical. And so I've learnt uh, picking from this. It's that um, right at seed set, I, I must have taken been the perfect timing for taking the test because that was right when the plant was turning from vegetative to reproductive. And you can see the the plants actually crashed itself to to put seed production in. And the downside of that is two weeks later, I had to put a fungicide on for rust. Um, the paddock just looked, yeah, two weeks after this test was sent, the paddock looked really unwell, um, just really struggling. So there was a, a foliar brew went on as well as a as foliar fungicide. Um, but you can see, you can see the stress the plants put itself in to go, you know, to, to reproduce. It's, um, yeah, it's quite, Quite amazing to actually see that snapshot, snapshot in time. <clears throat> so, going forward again, I think um, just maybe trying to load the plant up 
and it's just about monitoring growth stages and things like that and, and knowing what to look for, I suppose. Um, but yeah, the, the oats turned out really well. It was a yeah, really nice crop of oats. Um, but yeah, it's just that that was a hell of a head scratcher seeing a, a leaf test come back looking like that. Um, but yeah, just trying to load that plant up. The yeah, elite going forward is trying to, you know, is because I think it's the stress, the stress that the plant put itself in allowed the rust, whether it was whether it was a recessive gene that come through or whether it was something exterior that came in, but yeah, it certainly, certainly got nailed. But the, um, the foley brews and the fungicide certainly picked it up and um, it come through to a good harvestable crop. Yeah. Um, and this is some barley. This was actually, um, so there was, I had four barley trials in this year and I planted four different cover crops. So they were all, the, they were all identical cover crops, sorry. But um, two of them were grazed and two were not grazed, four different paddocks. Um, one was grazed hard and it was, I used Firebird as the, the, basically as the weed spray and it worked pretty well through most of the, most of the winter and then it had to have a tickle up in the spring. Uh, so this was autumn, uh, July sown barley. And then one, one was planted into a grazed and recovered cover crop and the birds seemed to enjoy it a lot so I'm not sure whether it was whether they were there but they um, certainly helped thin the barley out as it came through um, and then in the other two paddocks that were into um, green drilled green so they were uh, one of them I desiccated post planting one of them I desiccated two days pre planting and the birds kept away from them nicely um, both those crops were pretty healthy. Um, one of them, the one that I uh, sprayed off, desiccated to uh, post planting, didn't actually need a herbicide, follow up herbicide in the spring. Um, and in turn, that paddock actually didn't need a fungicide, although it did get one. Um, just, yeah, the, the health, plant health was phenomenal. Um, the other, yeah, they all got they all got the same fungicide. Uh, grow planet planet barley, which is it tends to get rusty. It's similar to the oats, really. I think it puts itself under a lot of stress going reproductive to uh, from vegetative to reproductive, and it tends to get rust just after on emergence, quite bad. So it's something you've just got to be wary of. And with fungicide withholding periods, it's, you don't get a lot of a lot of options uh, to sit back and wait, really. But um, yeah, they, they all they those all those crops went pretty well. Um, the one that had the firebird only, and then the follow-up herbicide, it was probably the weakest of the lot. Um, and I learnt that Phacelia does not like firebird one little bit, so there wasn't the only the only Phacelia that grew in the paddock as the companion, the sown companion was. Um, where I'd missed with the sprayer, which, yeah, so there's food for thought. Um, but as you can see, the barley was bricksing well, uh, it was pretty healthy, and it was harvested early January, I think about the 12th of January, so it gives you plenty of scope um, to get some, get a cover crop in post, post harvest and get lambs, yeah, bring lambs back in, or grazing, grazing stock back into the, into the property early. Um, that might end up biting me this year a wee bit with lambs on hand, but um, yeah, seasonal, you can't, can't plan that. Global pandemics and all. So, Nigel, no, the, um, we talked a bit, little bit before about, uh, or previously about um, using herbicides and the impact on um, fungal pressure and stuff later on with this trial. Yep. We observed that. Yes, it was this trial that I observed that. So the, having these four paddocks that were all planted within days of each other, um, I've and four the three the three paddocks that had the herbicides had three different programs, three different weed spectrums, and they all they all reacted very similar. But yeah, the one that didn't have a herbicide at all, apart from the post plant desiccation, uh, yeah, the plant health was phenomenal. Um, 
there was no sign of rust at all. I even left, I, while it did get a fungicide, because I'd mixed, I'd had it mixed, you know, I was prepared to spray all four paddocks, and it was mixed, ready to go. It did get the fungicide, but I did leave some strips, and right through to harvest, yeah, no, no need for a fungicide at all. So just observation-wise, I think you just go back through what you've done in bits and pieces, and I think it must be something in the herbicide that's caused a stress or allowed allowed a gene to express itself or something. I don't I don't really understand it fully, but it's yeah as an observation that was quite quite dumbfounding really, considering that planet usually gets rust real bad at that timing at that autumn emergence. So yeah, learning experience. So your your go to in future is the um post-plant desiccation? Yes. Well, it's certainly, and the fact that I didn't need a, need a herbicide as well, well, there's another, you know, there's another $65, $75 a hectare up your sleeve if you get it right too. So, um, yeah. And I guess in, in the future, if, you know, if a lot more herbicides are disappearing around the world, we, I, I guess we need to be looking at these options. Um, I still needed to desiccate the cover crop so I still needed something, but um, yeah, that was the cheapest one, I suppose. So Nigel, you, um, they were all spring or autumn sowing, those four? Uh, they were all, all uh, well actually winter sowing, um, okay. just with rain timing, they was planted early, ju uh, early June, yep. which turned out to be probably, well, it was, we got quite a few frosts in June this year, um, which was quite hard on it, made it slow, slow going, as that's, yeah, the, the paddock with the hard grazed cover crop and the slightly recovered cover crop were actually suffered a lot more, I guess, with the lack of ground cover. Um, and with being slow emerging too, the birds, I had a lot of birds picking it off at, as it was coming through. So I actually, yeah, it was, the, the cover crop certainly paid its way because it sort of, camouflage the crop a lot and it actually protected the ground. Um, I, the soil moisture was about a degree difference where the full cover was on. So it's, um, the cover crop certainly certainly paid for itself with, um, with plant growth and health going through that, you know, that tough part of the winter. In all honesty, I should have left the seed in the bag and let the cover crops keep going. Um, as it turned out, those frosts were actually pretty hard on the crops. Um, ideally, I suppose, if I was going to plant that time of year, they should have been done and planted in May, or, or as I said, left the cover crop just to grow and planted them in August after, the, after those severe frosts. Um, yeah, and the cover crops would have been a lot more, a lot more bulk then too, and possibly could have got another grazing. Um, which is an extra income too. So it's all, all food for thought going forward. I guess it's no two seasons are the same, are they? A um, couple of years ago, I managed to win the a few cups at the um, Ellsmere AMP show for um, seed entries. Uh, my spray free wheat, that was one of my eight ton crops actually. Um, it managed to win the premier premier sample, and um, yeah, unbeknownst to the judges, it was actually spray free. Uh, it wasn't wasn't revealed that it was spray free until after judging was complete. So that was quite a hoot. Um, yeah, and so I use some of my own spray free wheat. I've um, yeah, I've got my own wee flour mill at home and make make some of my own bread. And um, with this lockdown. Uh, Daughter and I, we actually made some um, some hot cross buns the other morning. And they were they were pretty nice too. So yeah, whole whole flour. So everything's in, nothing's out, and uh, it's yeah, really nice smell. Um, the flour milling, it's yeah, really cool. It's something I'd like to actually be able to supply to people going forward is fresh fresh flour, um, fresh whole flour. But yeah, that's a that's another conversation. Um, so this was my cover crop brew this year. Um, post oats and barley, and um, it's been pretty successful. Uh, so where my oats come off this year, um, 
we had, so the oats were unirrigated. They were harvested 22nd of December, 2019. Um, then I, I actually ended up burning the residue, um, just that I couldn't get the, the, there was too much residue for the, my old straw chopper on the combine and the drill, I couldn't get the drill to handle it up even post mulching. So I ended up burning the, burning the residue um, and planting this cover crop in and it's and watered it and that was so yeah and it was a, a beautiful looking cover crop actually uh, apart from the bursting clover which i couldn't source at the time so it, it was left out of the mix um, but everything else has gone all right um, and i've just desiccated that and planted it into a lucerne stand and so yeah two two waterings for this very dry season we've had and yeah it's it's come along well the lucerne's up now um, but yeah, it just shows that that ground cover and those mixed species certainly um, help with water retention. And you know, you, I look over the fence to to different different situations from different neighbours, and um, yeah, having having that ground cover certainly saves moisture. Uh, so that's the cover crop. Um, you can see the species in there. Uh, there's a buckwheat buckwheat of phacelia right in the middle. Crimson clover coming through it. Um, oh, the broadleaf in the bottom right is actually a um, pasture. Uh, I planted some pasture too in, in a couple of paddocks as well, just to bulk it up a wee bit for um, for some grazing stock that are coming into it. This is a different paddock to the ones that just gone into into oats. Um, but yeah, it's funny the um, the pasture has seemed to have brought the aphids into the paddock. They seem to be enjoying enjoying eating it. They're not not touching even anything else, but the um, and I don't know if there's anything in it either, but the um, the pasture that I bought was gaucho treated, um, only seed available. So I don't know whether whether there's something in that or not, but it's yeah, it's the only plant in the paddock that's had any bug damage, and it was the one that was treated. So I'll, I'll leave that at that. <laughs> and that was a cover crop mix I played with in my veggie garden a couple of years ago. So the Flanders field poppies, sunflowers, burridge, there was wild oat there, um, maybe even some fat hen there, but it was um, certainly made for some nice winter carrots. So, yeah, and the bees enjoyed it. Uh, that's a, uh, that's red, uh, red clover, maybe crimson clover. Oh, I think that's a red clover plant. Um, and yeah, you can see all the nodules, nodules on that fixing some nitrogen. Um, this is a, a cover crop that I've sown sunflowers in this year for Pure Oil NZ. So you can see the bulk, it was a cereal based cover crop with, um, it had uh, phacelia and white clover and some oats as well, black oats as well. Uh, so it was desiccated about six days pre-plant and yeah, you can see the you can see the trash level or the, the residue level in that next slide. Um, certainly, uh, certainly led to some ground cover. Um, I sowed uh, crimson clover as a companion with the sunflowers, and there was some volunteer black oats in there as well. And the um, certainly a um, a stunning looking paddock. Well, you can see. See the crimson clover there going hell for leather. Uh, the crimson clover I got from Simon Osborne. Um, yeah, it looked really, yeah, really stunning underneath those sunflowers. And it's, um, yeah, gave, gave NZ Oil some food for thought as well, because most of their paddocks had been cultivated in monoculture and um, with pre-emergent spray, as where mine was no, no pre-ems. Um, and yeah, good ground cover. And, you know, you can't see the cover crop through that. Nice paddock of sunflowers. And harvest time, two, two litres of red loam came through, um, desiccated the sunflowers, but it scorched the, um, the crimson clover and the bits and pieces underneath. But you can, as you can see, they've come back green in that slide. Um, and the sheep were on it the next day and yeah, It'll keep them for oh, for two or three weeks. So 
yeah, and then come back again for the winter. So Nigel, when you, when you drilled the uh, the sunflowers, that looked like it'd been roller crimp rolled or rolled. Was that just a drill that had laid the crop flat? Uh, so I ran our heavy flat roller over it post drilling. Um, there was a lot of slugs under there. Uh, the the roller was actually wet with slugs by the time I'd finished. But um, yeah, so that was that was drilled and then then heavy flat rolled uh, post drilling. Um, so that's yeah, that's that's my slideshow. Um, yeah, it was a, a definitely a um, a learning season. I've had some had some good successes. I've had some had a, a couple of yeah. My, as I said, my, my spray free work was an epic failure this year. I was very disappointed with that. Um, but going forward, I've I've learned a few bits and pieces, and um, yeah, roll on next year. The um. That last comment there brings up a probably a relevant point around slug control with all this um, ground cover um, year round. What are you what are you doing, or how much of a problem is that posing for you? And what's your kind of key ways of managing that? Um, so at this present time, the flat roller was a was a starting point, and then I spread um, dusk as a as my slug control, and it worked really well. I need and I also applied. Uh, five kilos to the hectare of diatomaceous earth on that paddock as well. Um, but yeah, slugs, once the, once the sunflowers were up and going, they were out of danger of slugs really. Um, but no, there, there was still a few slugs across that paddock. Um, but yeah, the, the dusk you know, gave me that foot in and, um, and the flat roller as well. But yeah, most, most of my paddocks planting into heavy residues have all had um, eight kilos of dusk applied as a slug, as a slug to, um, slug bait. So yeah, slugs are definitely something going forward um, that need to need to be aware of. Um, we've also got. I've done a bit of research. Um, I'm going to have a play with uh, cedar tree oil. So apparently, home gardens have been privy to this. Home gardens have been privy to the secret that cedar tree oil is um, is potent to slugs and snails for years. So, and I'm going to have a go at broad broad acres. So I've got got some cedar oil in the shed, and I'm gonna gonna have a play this year and see what I can come up with. So it'll be a watch this space for me. Awesome, um, Dave, Simon, any kind of anything that you think Nigel might have missed that you know that he's got going on at his place that people might be interested in? Um, Probably one thing, maybe what what would your take home message be around if you're going to be planting in your cover crops, the whole green drill versus desiccation I guess it depends on which cr what crop you're going into but is there yes. sort of an overall take-home message you think um, I've I yeah uh, the only downside I've found to it is that nitrogen um, the nitrogen tie up um, you know, if you all the all the readings and learnings I've done is the, the the microbes eat first so that's where that nitrogen disappears to, to get that system running. Um, I've been a bit more broad, made aware this year of allopathic effects and also um, glyphosate root, root exudates uh, leaching out of, as that desiccation. Um, I haven't found any issues with that that I know of, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a watch this space, I suppose. Yeah, and interesting. So. I'd... Um quite a few points here um, to do with the green sowing. I remember years ago Monsanto did some work when Roundup first probably was in the early 80s actually they did it but uh, 21 days was the key time for, for a plant back um, because you had that initial decay when the, the plant roots are fresh and freshly dying and you've got a massive bacterial activity um, and then that settles down once that initial decay has happened. Um, and 21 days, obviously it's gonna vary with the moisture levels and temperature and all the rest of it. But generally speaking, that was the key uh, time factor in terms of missing 
uh, reinfestation of greeblies living in the soil, allowing that decay to get started because you'll probably be about a six to eight week turnaround before you'll see any of those nutrients coming back to the following crop. Um, the, in terms of companions uh, and the crops, are, in the spring, the only success I've ever had was about 25 years ago with red clover and barley. And I planted, was trying to establish a red clover seed crop. And we, I planted, I think, three kilos of pawera in with 40 kilos of, of barley. And I had to windrow it, but I've still got, from 40 kilos of barley, I've got seven tons of bloody grain. So, and a massive amount of hay, but there's quite a bit of work in it. So, uh, but that was only a once. I've only ever done that once. So, um, I, I'm struggling with spring companions, actually. Yeah. Uh, I'm in the same boat. Yeah, I think possibly one of your annual clovers and um, bursine clover will grow tall like lucerne very quickly, but it may be the, it may be the one for the spring because um, I suspect it'll probably finish before everything else. Yes. Um, yeah, so that was really cool. Oh, and slugs, uh, well, are just a perennial problem, and I think low calcium levels definitely um, precipitate slug problems in soils. Um, so, but it doesn't, it's not a cure all either. Uh, yeah. you just, just got to live with them. But the, I think the, you know, the low toxicity baits like, like dusk are going to have the least amount of impact. And if cultivation and conventional agriculture killed slugs, there wouldn't be any, would there? <laughs> Good point. Um, so I, this year I planted, uh, oh, 16 hectares of blue peas for, for seed. And I put, uh, who are you? certified hooey clover down the spout with the peas. And yeah, beautiful, beautiful crop of clover sat nice, nice under the peas. I know I wouldn't get away with it every year, but um, they didn't, they were no issue at harvest time. I didn't need reglone to harvest or anything like that. Um, a wet season, it probably would have come back to bite me, but I've definitely got away with it. And I've got a huge, yeah, beautifully established hooey um, seed crop for next year in, in this where these peas were. So. That's one thing that worked this year, but um, yeah, I would doubt I'd get that to work every year. Um, just yeah, wet year, the, the clover would just be very vigorous and would be a pain in the bum at harvest time. So, but um, this year got away with it. And I guess that's the beauty of having a, um, a long range weather forecast that you can rely on. Um, I've given up listening to Met Service in Niwa. <laughs> yeah. I think they tell people what they want to hear, not what's actually going to happen. So, so when's it going to rain, Nigel? <laughs> um, well, my long-range forecast's got nothing, nothing in it until early May. So there you go. There's some bad news for you. <laughs> hey, um, one possibly last question because we've been going for close to 35 minutes. Um, but you wanted to talk about the making sure that people include fish in with their glyphosate. Um, Yes, so I've I've been playing with low rates of glyphosate for quite a few years, and I used to my my go-to brew used to be um, a liter and a half of, of Roundup Renew, which was three hundred and sixty, and I put three hundred mils of Star Rain with it, and five well, it was actually ten liters of fish with it, and every time I got a beautiful brown out, no no return, no no regrowth, and um, yeah, it worked really well. And then I was, I ended up dropping the star rain and adding in the fish and adding mobilizer or fulvic. And I found it was while it was really good knockdown, I was getting a few escapees, especially grass plants. Um, so I had to up the glyphosate rate up to about 1100 grams of active. Um, and then putting the fish back in has certainly certainly helped but I still think going forward I think that adding the wee bit of star rain to it certainly um, well certainly going forward I think will help with um, any resistance issues but that's just just my opinion I'm open to open to discussion on that <laughs> but I still think um, mobilizer on its own is not the key I think I think you need at least four four liters of um, fish hydrolysate in that mix as well even if it is just Glyphosate fish and mobiliser. Yeah. 
I don't know, what are your thoughts on that one, chaps? Yeah, I've, I've changed. We used to use the high active ingredient roundups and, um, you know, the 490, and, and I've gone back to the 360. Um, we generally we're about at that three litre rate um, with some fulvic and, um, and also some at times with the fish as well. I do think when you add the fulvic and the fish together, that's certainly a lot better brew than um, each one individually. Um, so yeah, we've gone from uh, certainly reduced the amount of active chemical going on those crops, and and we've found that the control at a sort of just over a thousand grams of active is, is just as good as um, the previous ones at, at fifteen hundred grams of active. So um, yeah, yeah, it's I'd, certainly I'd a lot that. cheaper as well. Yes. Yeah. So I've um I found this the star rain. The addition of a bit of star rain actually helps broaden the spectrum, especially when you've got like a bit of mallow in the paddock or nettles or things like that. Um, or if you're actually trying to get rid of some clovers, um, that little bit of star rain, all right, yes, it's active ingredient wise, it shouldn't kill those plants, but yeah, mixed with that brew, certainly, certainly seems to knock them around. But then you've got to be aware of plant back as well. Um, depends what you're putting in post post desiccation too for adding star rain to it. I guess it's similar to using hammer or sharp and all those ones as well. But I do find star rain's easier to wash out of a machine than some of those other other products. Awesome. Um, any last burning questions for Nigel, Simon? Oh yeah sorry Nigel, what rate of star rain were you using? Three hundred mils. Oh okay, yeah. No, because I've done that a bit too and uh Certainly seems to hot it up for some reason. I don't know why. Yes, they, they more, just more so than you would more so than you would expect with what you're putting in. Yes. Yep. Definitely. So that's just a brief overview of what I've been up to. Um, I yeah, there's, I'm all, always playing, always trying. Um, essential oils seem to be a, a good go-to for me for for bits and pieces, and this seem to be I don't know. I must be reasonably interested in them. I keep trying them. So. Watch the space on the slug control anyway. Alrighty. Um, I hope that was uh, all clear as um, clear audio wise for everybody. Down to my own voice. Oh yeah. Way to get <laughs> to it. Aids. Um, just while so there's a um, for those of you um, there's a few questions that uh, have been coming into the chat that Nigel's been answering. Uh, just typing in as we've been going, so you can look through those. Um, and if he hasn't answered uh, answered your question sufficiently, feel free to chuck it, um, chuck a new one up um, back in there, and um, and we'll answer them live. And uh, the I was actually just while people are starting to type in their questions, um, Nigel, did you want it? There's, you didn't really talk too much about your. Uh, you mentioned the cedar um, cedar oil that you're using, but you didn't necessarily cover off the kind of um, the other essential oils that you've been using and what they've been using for, which um, just while people are chucking some questions up. Yep, so I originally started playing with tea tree oil. Um, uh, yeah, when it was when I was doing carrots and I got, yeah, quite sick on um, organic phosphate, 4-8 uh, um, poison first year I was in carrots and everything. From that year on, I was always looking for a, something I could replace it with. Um, initially, it was like I was planting it, planting it with the carrot seed for for grass scrub was that initial control, and then I was using it twice more during the season for carrot rust fly. And I ended up, um, son came home from school with head lice one day, and a lot, quite a few parents were using Frontline Plus because that seemed to work pretty well on the kids' heads, but um, yeah, I. Um, someone said to me tea tree oil, so I did a, so I did a wee bit of research, and it turns out that tea tree oil kills eggs and larvae, and I sort of thought, hang on a minute, if it if it'll take take lice out of a kid's head and stop them coming back, well, what's it going to do on the paddock? So, I started playing, imported a wee bit of tea tree oil off, um, I got it off eBay, and um, yeah, I found that I could actually replace my tooth. Four eight applications with tea tree oil um, for carrot rust fly prevention, and that worked really well. Um, yeah, 
but tea tree, tea tree oil turns out a um, dangerous good because it has a flash point lower than petrol, um, so it gets expensive when you're importing it in any volumes. So I was, yeah, so that's where the peppermint oil came in after that, and I also played with a bit of neem oil as well, but it was I found it was hard to actually wash out of spraying equipment. Um, it's quite glunky. Um, but yeah, peppermint oil seems to be my go-to now. And um, yeah, it's uh, aphids absolutely hate it. Um, but the sprayer spell is nice for a few weeks, so it's yeah, quite cool. <laughs> right on. Um, no one's posted any new questions in yet, um, on team. Um, but maybe we cover off a couple of ones that have um, you know, coming in there, one was around James Helford asking about uh, adding citric acid, and that's something that um, I think it was Canon on the Facebook group um, mentioned. And I've seen it before using citric acid to lower the pH um, to increase glyphosate effectiveness. Yeah, um, so Dave Mitchell's been doing that for a few years, so he could probably answer that one a bit more than I could. Um, I think the, the idea of the citric acid was to lower the pH of the tank mix, but I bought myself a wee P, a, a you know, pH meter, and I found that the pH, our water around here is about 7.1 pH, with the addition of the three litres of glyphosate, that brought the tank mix back to about 5.4 or 5.6, and then the 500 mils of mobiliser would actually bring the tank mix down to uh, a pH of around 4.2, 4.3. So I was in, under the impression that the the citric acid was there to lower the pH, which is where glyphosate works the best, so I've been told. Um, so I never really played with the citric acid idea because I did, felt I didn't need to with the, with the mobiliser um, doing the job of the pH dropper. So, but yeah, I'm, yeah, I've, I haven't, I haven't played with citric acid. I know, I didn't realise that mobiliser did that, so. Yeah, mobiliser's got a pH of about I think off the top of my head about three two or something like that. It's quite acidic. As where fulvic acid is actually a neutral. It's um that's the opposite end of the scale. I think it's got a pH of about eight. Is that fulvic or humic? Uh humic acid, sorry. Is yeah, is a is an alkaline. Fulvic's an acid, so yeah. Um Right, oh, well, you've obviously you've got a spellbound audience because still no one's tucked up any new questions. Um I was wondering about so we had that big long convo on the WhatsApp this week about slugs and it was something that you touched on um, in that presentation. Have you, did you learn anything or what were your kind of key takeaways out of the slug convo on WhatsApp? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I've got no slug pressure at the moment because I'm dry. And, um, but yes, yeah, uh, my arable reps mentioned just as soon as you get the paddocks Planted and um, and watered, um, the slugs are certainly certainly coming out of hibernation. So just be be front footing it. Um, dusk at a half rate is about I think it's about thirty five or forty dollars a hectare. As where I'm hoping to this season to have a play with the cedar tree oil, like I alluded to, and I'm picking that if I can get slug control at a hundred mils per hectare, like I'm using most of my other essential oils at that puts slug control at about eight to $12 a hectare. But I haven't haven't tried that yet. It's a work in progress. So I will definitely keep you all posted on that one. And have you tried the lime and salt? Um, no, I haven't. Um, yeah, I yeah I haven't, no. Uh, so now we've got a couple of questions up. Um, one from Dave Burkett. Have you looked at your sowing rate in the wheat to control the companion plant's growth? Um, so this year I planted, uh, so it was census wheat that I was planting for the spray free and I planted 135 a hectare. Um, pr last year I planted 175 kilos to the hectare but I was planting later, that was um, 175 I planted second week of October. Uh, this year I planted 135 and I did it. So I think I'm pretty sure I planted it late August, early September. And yeah, I think, yeah, the, well, the, the Phacelia wasn't really, 
thick across the paddock. It was just each plant was, I think just, yeah, because the wheat was a bit thin, each plant got a really good go on and the stems were the size of your little finger sort of style. So that was what came back to bit me, uh, bite me, should I say. Um, question, <laughs> question from um, Peter, uh, do you want to come comment on bare seed, um, perhaps what you might use for seed treatments going forward? Uh, so last year with my four barley trials, uh, two of those paddocks were bare seed that I'd saved myself. The other two paddocks were Rancona and Peridian 30, which is a uh, dust inhibitor with micronutrients in it. Uh, the Rancona was the minimum treatment I could get due to uh, fusarium loadings. Um, I my the heaviest crop, the heaviest yield crop, and was the was my own saved bare seed, and I was planting that. Of all of those, all four paddocks got planted with 200 grams of trichoderma. Um, yeah, so the bare seed definitely I wouldn't be scared of it unless yeah I guess. Treading in first first year into a regen system, you've got to yeah. There's definitely some um, some things you'd have to watch for. I wouldn't go in cold turkey probably, um, depending you know grass grub loadings and things like that. But I I still think getting rid of the narrow nicks out of our system is definitely something that we need to be very very or have it in the right in front of our minds. Um, a before they're taken off us. Um, due to the, you know, just taken off us and B, to the negative effects, I think um, they could be having an issue to our burdening slug pressure and that came through in our WhatsApp um, conversation the other day that even though, for example, carob beetles aren't ingesting the neonics, they are actually possibly getting secondary poison poisoning. So, um, yeah, I think... Yeah, seed treatment's a, a funny one. I, in my opinion, I think the um, seed companies, that's where they make all their money out of selling your seed. Um, don't be scared to try and drop some of those. Um, I know, yeah, I know they, they, you're treated like a leper when you ask for BSC, but um, persevere. Trichoderma is actually, I've, I've, um, a neighbour did a good trial this year with trichoderma on, and BSC seed and had uh, better results than treated seed yield wise and so there's definitely I definitely um, think that's a, a definitely a way forward and it's reasonably cheap as well um, also uh, a few people looking at putting liquid systems on their on their machinery to you know get liquid humates and bits and pieces into the fish and um, even mil uh, molasses into the seed slot as well so there's there's definitely some room to play with these um, with bare seeds and, and um, biological treatments. Okay. Um, question from Roger: Do you have a fixed crop rotation? No, <laughs> no. I'm quite sporadic. Um, some years I'll I'll barley barley. Some years will be a, a some some paddocks will be a four five six year rotation. But yeah, some yeah I'm I'm sporadic at best. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, no, no fixed rotation is easy way to answer that. Sweet. Right, well, it looks like we're um, coming to the end of the questions. So, um, is there anything else you want to um, chip in, or perhaps um, if, there's, if there's anyone that's desperately um, wanting to contribute something, um, maybe put your hand up in the chat um, and I'll um, unmute you because we've got 10 minutes or so that we can fill in um, if we want but sorry back to you Nigel. Yes yeah, so one of my one of the barley crops I sowed this year was into a, the, one of the full full retained um, cover crop. I was actually sowing that as the same in yeah, same time my neighbours were plowing and uh, about four weeks later I jumped we'd had quite a few heavy frosts and I jumped the fence and with the soil moisture probe and I was a degree about a degree and a quarter warmer than their bare ploughed soil versus my soil straight over the fence. So I, I, yeah, the cover crop definitely helps, you know, helps keep the soil a bit warmer. Um, and you know, midwinter that's definitely a plus. A degree and a half is huge. So um, yeah, food for thought. They were laughing at me planting into a green cover crop while I was laughing at them ploughing. So that's a 
two different systems. We were both right, but yeah, that was um, good fun. Right on. Uh, James put up his hand. Um, so James, if you'd like to unmute yourself and good evening. Or should I unmute you? There you go. Oh. Here we go. Hi, James. Yeah, sorry, I've been stabbing the keyboard frantically. <laughs> I didn't know how to operate all this. So I've, I suppose a number of questions. So I've, um, I've got hold of, I'm going to drill bare seeded wheat. You know, I've, I've been tending to go at this thing called Turkey, which you've just advised against it. But anyway, what the hell? Well, you, you, you're going in with plenty of friends. So <laughs> we've, we're all giving you advice. Um, so I've held off dr uh, drilling the, the wheat as early as I normally do, which be like the very start of April. And I'm planning to start drilling it next week because I was trying to reduce the, the aphid burden um but do you think with the with peppermint oil that you could actually go back to drilling at the beginning of uh april um i i i rely i think peppermint oil is a very very valuable tool so yes would be my answer to that um i've had great success with it um on on aphids um, I had I, about three seasons ago. I planted bare barley seed, and it was a season when nothing stopped growing down here. Um, people had wheat at uh, the neighbours had wheat at growth stage thirty one. You know, sort of early September. They were both really early anyway. I, I, yeah, don't quote me on the dates and numbers, but it was a winter where nothing stopped growing and everyone, most, most people were out putting aphicides on every, you know, 20, 25 days. And I got away with two, two doses of hundred mils of peppermint oil for the season with no yellow dwarf virus. Um, if yeah, negatives at all. Um, so yeah, I was, I, I rely on it as a, um, as a tool. I think it's as effective, if not more effective than, um, than commercial insecticides. So you think the persistence is as, as good as the commercial insecticides? I'm not sure on the persistence. Um, I do think it does rain. It does have, because it's an oil, it does actually have some rain retardant itself. Um, I, I wouldn't give you a day, day length that it would actually stay on the plant. But I, that season, I did two applications and they were about 35 days apart. And I was just had my yellow sticky traps in the paddock and a couple of sites and I was just monitoring. And um, I was mainly catching moths and bees. But yeah, I got a couple of aphids in the trap one day. So I went out with 100 mils of peppermint oil. And um, yeah, same thing about, it was about 35, 36 days later, I did the same thing again. So I'm I was- not I'm allowed to ask uh, any more questions. Yeah, but uh, we'll just, um, Peter's actually just got one that on the same topic. Uh, would early wheat planting with a sheep grazing be a good combat to aphids? Um, I don't know the answer to that one. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I haven't really grown a lot of early sown winter wheat. Uh, there'd be a few others in the group that are probably more, more um, educated in that instance. I know Simon Osborne grew some winter wheat this year that he grazed, and um, that was his best yielding wheat. Yeah, so yeah, I'm not sure. Sweet, cheers for that. James, next question. I think Dave's going to join us yeah. as well. Yeah, uh, I started listening to the uh, FAR podcast this morning, Joe Drummond talking about uh, choosing your wheat varieties. Uh, I haven't listened to it all, but but one point that she raised was um, wheat stubble harbors a lot of septoria and you know I've got wheat stubble all around the farm this year and um, do you do you think it is a, a potential problem with septoria or, or I think that... that's where septoria is actually coming from is actually that um, overwintered stubble and I think from what I've read I don't I'm not no professor in this at all but I think septoria septoria can be culturally controlled by planting a wee bit later. Um, I think that yeah, the earlier you plant, probably the the more likely you are to get septoria. That's just my what I've read and understand. 
Um, David might actually be able to answer that one a lot better than I could. I see he's... Well, I think, I think we've talked, actually I've talked, spoken to David about this and also choosing the right variety. Um, yes. Yeah, well, David found this year that um, genetics was probably better than fungicide. So, um, yeah. Here's a bit of a teaser for next week's episode with Mr. Dave That's Berg it. himself. <laughs> Hey, um, Dave, are you jumping in there with a question? Or do you have something to add? Um, oh, I was just, just going to comment on um, the septoria one. I'm doing the same, James. I'm delaying my autumn sown wheat a um, couple of weeks from sort of early April to late April. And over the years, I think that two weeks is at least one fungicide out of the program if you've got a susceptible variety. Um, it has been my think, feeling. Um, the comments on the grazing, we've done some grazing trials here with the 2020 work. And if you can predict the season um, in the high disease seasons, the grazing with the highest yielding, and in the low disease yield uh, seasons, the uh, grazing was the lowest. So if you had a magic point, you knew what the ball. season was going to be, um, you'd, you'd work out where you're going to graze them. But, but grazing from a cultural point of view, it's doing both. It's it's getting rid of the aphids as well as um, a lot of disease inoculum that's on those leaves. Um, so yeah, it's certainly a good option. If, you know, if you're uh, if you're organic and you've got the option to graze, um, it's it's a good, good option. Awesome. Um, did you have another question there, James? We've got about three minutes, and we'll we'll wrap it up as promised. Uh, I'll probably, I'll probably got so many questions. I, unfortunately, I missed the, the first quarter of an hour, so I'll, I'll have to catch up with Nigel and, and the others at another time. You know, I've got so many questions. I think this will be recorded, James, so you'll be able to listen to it again. Um, All right. I, I, are you doing another one next week, did you say, Sam? Yep. So um, this is going to be, we're probably going to look to do five or six of these over the next um, five or six weeks. So every Thursday night, uh, 8 p.m. Um, and I'll keep sending those links out um, to the WhatsApp. I've um, I, I posted a video uh, about establishing rate crop into an existing cover crop. I think I'm optimistic about how it's going to go. Um, there's quite a lot of cereals and oats in it, and uh, got quite a few legumes in it. And I, I think, if need be, that's the cat. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think I'm fairly optimistic. You know, I can certainly take the cereals out out of the brassica and uh, yeah, thank you, Chesney. Um, and I'll I'll make a judgment call on the on the legumes. You know, if they're going to be a, be a problem, I think you know versatile or perilib will take them out, um, no problem. But I, I I'm also it would actually be quite nice if all those legumes stayed under the crop because definitely the, as no, long as they I, don't I, 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 compete it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the thing. I mean, we'll just have to see if it's a dry summer, then it, mm. it won't be an issue. Um, so that crop's potentially going to be glyphosate free, isn't it? Yes. I mean, I mm. don't put glyphosate on brassicas. When would you put glyphosate on? You I mean, because to... you, you haven't desiccated your cover crop with glyphosate. No, so that's, that's right. It would have and... been 12 months or well, six months since its last glyphosate application, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and um, we'll be able. To, I think we'll be able to graze it. You know, we've got we've got plenty of feed there even now. But it's just that the the brassica is just too small. They'll yeah. come, they'll pull them pull them pull it out. Yep. But I'm I'm optimistic. I think it it could be awesome. Interesting. Yeah. Mm. Well, hey, thanks everyone for listening. Um, I hope I didn't bore. Um, but yeah. My phone's usually always on, so I'm happy to chat about anything outside of it if you, if you have any questions. Um, I never profess to say that I know it all, um, which I, I definitely don't. Um, so I will be relying on you, all of you in the group for, for input as it goes through the next season anyway. So, yeah, keep the sharing going. Beauty. And um, for when this goes public, if anyone wants to get in touch with any specific questions, then contact at quorumsense.org.nz is the email address that'll reach me and I can point you to the to the right person. And um, yeah, thanks very much, team. Appreciate it. Cool. Thanks, have guys. A, have a good evening and thanks, we'll guys. see most of you um, in a week's time, hopefully.
So Sounds uh, great. Yuri. Have a good week. Bye. Cheers. Cheers.